Dead America, Mississippi Caravan, Dead America, The Third Week, Book Six. Written by Derek Slayton. Narrated by P.J. Morgan. Chapter One, Day Zero Plus Eighteen. A locomotive rolled down the tracks through rural Louisiana, sun glinting off of the sparkling exterior. The front ten cars, having been liberated from a commuter line in Kansas, made for a comfortable ride for the hundred or so troops traveling within. The remaining eight cars were jam-packed with essential goods, like bottled water, ammunition, and greenhouse building materials. The front commuter car was the closest to the engine, and so was by far the loudest. As a result, it was also the emptiest. A few soldiers curled up in the back seats, fighting the urge to wake up. Towards the front sat a handful of awake soldiers, staring out the window at the world whipping by. Private Watkins was one such soldier, brushing his sandy blonde hair back from his forehead. The tall city boy had joined the military straight out of high school a few years prior, managing to stay stateside, despite the numerous flare-ups around the globe. Having felt like he hadn't done enough to help his nation and defend his country, he'd volunteered for this dangerous escort mission. His mood reflected what the once lush green hills had become, scarred black by bombs and fire, hundreds of corpses dotting the landscape. Thankfully, none at this juncture were moving. Private Jones shook his head, Hell of a mess out there, ain't it? He asked, the morning sun glinting off of his dark, bald head. Kinda hard to believe there were that many of those things out here that it would require a bombing campaign like that, Watkins replied, turning to his buff friend. They'd met in basic training and had been stationed together in Kansas before the world turned to shit. Jones hopped across the aisle to sit across from his friend, taking in the grisly view. Well, we're only about 15 miles away from Mississippi, and our friends in the Navy caused one hell of a ruckus last week, he shrugged. Must have drawn quite the crowd. Still can't believe they... Watkins shook his head. We cut off the entire East Coast from the rest of the country. Jones leaned forward, resting his arms on his knees. Hey now, that wasn't our call, he said firmly. People way above our pay grade thought it was best. Well, given their stellar track record in recent years, Watkins replied with a roll of his eyes. Who am I to doubt them? Jones chuckled, joined by a few of the other soldiers sitting behind them. Amen, brother, one of them declared, raising his fist into the air in solidarity. And besides, Jones continued, we haven't completely cut them off. If we had, then you and I wouldn't be on this train headed to Mississippi to run goods up to survivors. Watkins took a deep breath and then let it out slowly, not meeting his friend's gaze. Yeah, I guess you're right. Ain't no guessing needed, Jones exclaimed. We gonna be helping people out, helping them survive this shit. His friend nodded jerkily. That's true. And it could be a lot worse, Jones reminded him holding up a finger. We could be headed up to the Northwest. Watkins' brow furrowed. Northwest? Yeah, lots of people are being shipped up there, Jones replied with a shrug. Rumor has it there's some sort of major offensive being planned. His friend shook his head vigorously. Can't imagine, he admitted. I'd much rather be out here in the sticks than going up to Seattle or Portland. Damn right. Jones agreed. A lot more dangerous places to be than right here. The soldier who'd raised a fist turned halfway towards them. Like Kansas City. Shit, man, Jones blurted with a gasp. You were at Kansas City? Heard that whole deal was foobar. The soldier turned fully around, revealing severe burns on his face that covered his left eye. The flesh still looked raw and fresh, shining with gooey blisters. Fubar would be putting it lightly. The duo blinked at him, swallowing hard in unison at the sight of his mangled face. I've heard stories, Watkins said hoarsely, trying to cover up his visible reaction to the disfigured man. Shit that will haunt me for years, 
and I wasn't even there. The soldier leaned on the back of his seat. Let's put it this way, he explained. If this were the 1950s, they would be making movies about Kansas City, with John Wayne leading the charge into the horde, like he was storming the beaches of Normandy. He shook his head. Of course, much like those movies, the reality was far worse than what was on screen. Did, did that, Jones waved his hand in front of his face. Did that happen there? Watkins stared at him with wide eyes, as if to ask his friend what the fuck he was thinking, asking a tactless question like that. Yeah, I got this lovely parting gift there, the soldier replied, seemingly not offended. We were at a staging area at this truck stop a quarter mile from the front lines, or so we thought. He sighed. Everybody was checking their gear and waiting for the go order, all the while we could hear the battle raging in the distance. As we sat there with our thumbs up our asses, the gunfire in the distance quickly decreased in volume. A lot of the boys were getting excited, thinking the battle was going to be over before we even got there. He ran his tongue over his teeth. This was proven wrong just a few minutes later. Jones rubbed the back of his neck. Run, runners? The soldier nodded. Hundreds of them, he confirmed. They came running over the hill like a swarm of army ants. Panic quickly set in, with random firing by some and fleeing by most. We had almost no protection from them, just a handful of sandbag barricades that were maybe knee high to a preschooler. It caused them to stumble when they got to it, but not much else. Watkins gaped at him. How did you manage to get out alive? He asked. Quick thinking and a nasty smoking habit, the soldier replied. The duo shared a confused look and then turned back to him expectantly. A buddy of mine flipped on the gas and started spraying it liberally. The soldier continued. He kept doing it even as he got overwhelmed by those things. Only thing I could do at that point was flick my lighter, toss it, and run. Before I could even get out of the parking lot, the fire was raging like it was a Northern California forest. Jones blinked at him. So you saved the day? No, the soldier replied, shaking his head. There was no saving that day. It slowed a lot of them down, but turned most of them into running torches. Got tackled by one who got a little too close. He motioned to his face, which is why I'm so pretty now. The duo cracked a small smile at his joke, hanging on his every word. Don't know how many soldiers we lost that day, but if that operation is a preview to what they're doing in the Northwest. He trailed off for a beat, and then shook his head again. We're a lot better off right here. Watkins ran his hands through his hair. That's horrific, man. He let out a deep whoosh of breath. Yeah. I mean, why in the world aren't you in a med bay somewhere recuperating? Jones piped up. Or at least getting some shore leave. The soldier shrugged. Our enemy isn't resting, he said. Figured I shouldn't either. The train began to squeal, signaling the braking procedure. The soldiers looked out the window, gazing over the Mississippi River. On the south side stood the ruins of the commuter bridge, a couple hundred yards away obliterated by cruise missiles. Jones swallowed hard. Navy ain't fucking around. The burned soldier stood up and pulled a bag from underneath his seat. He flung it over his shoulder and headed for the back door to the other train cars. You boys be safe out there, he called back to them. Keep your heads about you, stay vigilant, and you'll come through this okay. The duo nodded thoughtfully and then shared a tense look before staring out the window again. The train lurched to a stop outside of a large rest area. Here we go, Jones said, and they got to their feet. Chapter Two The soldiers disembarked from the train, roaming around the large grassy field, several making a beeline to the restrooms across the way. Watkins and Jones stood in the grass and stretched, enjoying the fresh air as they worked their sore muscles from being trapped on the train for what felt like a long few days. So now what, 
Jones asked, adjusting his weapons and equipment bags that were securely strapped to him. Watkins pointed past him, noticing a strip of food trucks lined up next to the rest stop, lines of soldiers at the windows. How about some breakfast? Fuck yeah, dude, Jones exclaimed as he surveyed the trucks. Let's get it. They walked over, seeing several options for food. One station had breakfast tacos, others with burgers. One of them was making fancy fajitas with tzatziki sauce. Jones quickly fell into the burger line. Watkins raised an eyebrow. A burger for breakfast? Man, when is the last time you had a fresh cheeseburger? Jones replied wistfully, rubbing his hands together. Who cares about what time it is? A soldier who had picked up his order walked down the line, burger in hand. He took a bite and grimaced, prompting Jones to reach out and touch his arm. Yo, you all right, dude? He asked, cocking his head at the food. The soldier nodded. Yeah, he said, swallowing with a wince. I just wasn't expecting a frozen turkey burger. Jones blinked at him and then took a big step to the side, joining his friend in the breakfast taco line. You know, some eggs and sausage sound good right about now. Watkins chuckled, shaking his head. A megaphone squealed, and they turned towards a figure at the top of the hill. Okay, everybody, listen up, the figure barked. Welcome to the front lines of this shit show. I know you all have had a long journey, so take 10, get some chow, and enjoy this little bit of sunshine before the clouds come rolling in. When you got what you need, start heading north to the casino. It's about a mile up the river, and we're meeting in the hotel lobby in 30. The duo turned back to the food truck, with only a few soldiers left in line in front of them. Breakfast and a hike, Joan said with a sigh. This day's already shaping up to be a doozy. They reached the window and the guy behind the counter slid them each a foil-wrapped taco before yelling, next. The soldiers grabbed their spoils and moved out of the way, unwrapping their tacos as they walked. They bit into their delicious wraps as they headed towards the front of the train to cross the tracks. There was a small army of workers in pickup trucks, backed up against the transport cars of the train, unloading the goods from within by hand. That seems a bit inefficient. Jones mumbled through a mouthful of egg. Watkins shrugged. Well, if you happen to know of a nearby train yard they can unload in, I'm sure they'd love to know about it, he retorted. His friend nodded without answering and shoved the butt end of his taco in his mouth, chewing for a while to draw out the flavors. They crossed the tracks and headed north towards the casino. The troops spread out along the road, leaving a few lanes open on the left for the trucks to pass them by. The sun shone on their backs, creating an unseasonably warm day, but the trees lining the road provided comfortable shade. Light murmurs of chatter rippled through the men, but Jones and Watkins stayed silent, enjoying the moment of peace as they strolled towards what was sure to be a hectic day. As the casino came into view, they stared at their destination, the parking lot was filled with dozens of tractor trailers, a hive of activity buzzing around the area. The trucks that had been whizzing by them pulled up to the backs of the trailers, unloading goods rapidly. Supervisors stood on the backs of a few of the trucks, rolling around and barking out orders, waving frantically for workers to move and drive and lift in perfect synchronicity. Man, that is a whole lot of trucks, Watkins murmured as they walked. Jones nodded. Makes you wonder just how many survivors are in this neck of the woods, he added. Well, we essentially have to service the entire southern portion of the country, Watkins pointed out. Not too many bridges left over the river. The thought made his friend clench his jaw as the realization set in that they were to be the only lifeline to God knew how many survivors. This shit just gets crazier by the hour, he muttered. They stayed away from the loading zone, skirting the parking lot to get to the front entrance of the casino. They stepped inside to see the hive was just as active on the inside as the outside. The one difference was the cool blast of air conditioner, smacking them in the face at the door. Damn, that feels fantastic, Watkins moaned happily, 
closing his eyes as they entered. Jones sighed in agreement. If the power's on, there must be a higher up here, he mused. Can't have ranked officers sweltering with the enlisted after all. Soldiers and civilians wound their way through the lobby, most carrying goods, while others rearranged furniture, making more room. Some were at the windows, working to reinforce them in case of an attack, undead or alive. As the newcomers milled about, looking around, a woman wearing a hotel uniform appeared from a side hallway. She held up her hand, waving and speaking loudly. Show of hands, who just arrived on the train? She asked, her voice carrying above the noise without being a yell. Watkins and Jones raised their hands, along with a smattering of soldiers hanging around. The woman looked down at her clipboard and scribbled as she counted. Okay, thank you very much, she said, and pointed behind them. If you will all head down the hallway to the first conference room on the left, Captain Holt will be with you shortly. The soldiers headed along, Watkins and Jones in the middle, following the young woman's orders. The conference room was a huge space, filled with chairs and a projector screen lighting up the far wall. A trio of men in civilian clothes sat to the side. Watkins and Jones took a seat in the front row, looking around as their brethren filtered in, filling the room. When it seemed as if the stream of soldiers had finished, a short, stocky, balding man that looked to be in his late forties entered, closing the doors behind him. All right, everybody, get situated so we can get this show on the road, he barked, striding around the perimeter to the front of the room. He stopped and pointed at a cluster of soldiers in the back who were still standing. Sit your fucking ass down and shut the fuck up before I strap you to one of those semis out there and ride you right into the middle of a fucking horde, he yelled. The room went completely silent, and the soldiers all dropped to their seats. The man took a deep breath, smoothing down his shirt, and straightened his shoulders. First of all, welcome to the front lines of what is the single largest rescue and aid operation in the history of this country, he said, voice professional and smooth, a far cry from just moments ago. I'm Captain Holt, and I'm running this show. I don't know how much you were told before volunteering or being assigned to this outpost, so I'm going to go over the basics. He waved his hand, and somebody turned off the lights. He flicked the switch on the side of the projector, stepping to the side as the wall lit up. The first slide on was a map of the southern states on the east side of the Mississippi River. There were several hundred small red dots on it, some as far away as the southern tip of Florida. America is known for a lot of things, the captain said. Baseball, apple pie, and the most strip clubs per capita of any nation in the free world. He paused as laughter rippled through the soldiers, tentatively but welcome to break the tension. And an abundance of resiliency, Holt continued. It's that last point that has led to each and every one of these red dots on the map. What you see here are groups of survivors, that the boys in D.C. have been able to identify via satellite and radio communications. He motioned to the map. It's our mission to resupply these civilians and make sure they can ride out this storm. He hit the button, and a new image popped up, with a bullet point list of goods. The captain stepped aside, taking a moment for the soldiers to read the items, like food, water, and different kinds of weapons. This is what you're going to be carrying across the land he continued, food so that they can get through the short term, supplies to help them set up gardens so they can survive long term, and a healthy amount of guns, because, well, this is America, damn it, and everybody needs at least one in the apocalypse. He held up his hands at another ripple of laughter, motioning for them to quiet down. In all seriousness, the supplies you will be in charge of should be treated like they're worth their weight in gold, because they are, the vast majority of supply lines have been severed in this country, which means almost nothing new is being produced. This thing hits so quickly that there isn't a stockpile we can pull from. He raised his chin and took a deep breath. Lives were lost to get these. A somber calm fell over the room as he waited a beat for his words to sink in. When you're in these trucks, the captain continued, I want each and every one of you to remember that point, Honor the fallen by completing your mission. 
A chorus of hoots and hollers and hell yeahs erupted, fists flying into the air as the soldiers pumped themselves up. Holt nodded firmly and hit the projector again, pulling up a fresh map with three nearby targets. At the moment, he said loudly, prompting the room to quiet down again. We have a shortage of truck drivers, but that will be rectified soon enough. To my left here are three of the finest drivers this side of the Mississippi. Their trucks are loaded up and ready to roll to these three locations. Now I need three teams of two to step up and volunteer for the first runs. Two sets of people immediately stood up, and Jones shot to his feet. Watkins stared up at him in shock, and his friend grabbed a fistful of his sleeve, pulling him up as well. Okay, thank you all, Holt said. If you want to come forward, I'll brief you on your route today. He motioned to the rest of the men, waving for the door. The rest of you can head back out into the lobby, where you'll be assigned a room for the night, before being put to work in the yard. Dismissed. As the room began to empty, Watkins leaned over to his friend. What the hell, man? He hissed quietly. Why did you volunteer us for this? Because it's not that far away, Jones replied. Should be an easy day. You saw how far away some of those sites are. They'll be on their way to Florida by the time we get back. Watkins contemplated for a moment, before shrugging with agreement. His friend had a point. The rest of the volunteers walked to the front of the room, converging around the projector, and Holt waved over the three drivers. He pointed out each driver, introducing each to their team. He approached Watkins and Jones last, heading over with a slightly overweight, thick man with a scraggly beard and wild, balding hair that looked like it hadn't been combed since the turn of the millennium. Gentlemen, Holt said, clapping the man on the shoulder. I'd like to introduce you to your driver. This is Buddy. He headed off, leaving the burly driver covered in cheap-looking tattoos of naked women and skulls to get acquainted with his team. Guys, how we doing? Buddy asked, extending a hand, his voice sounding like he'd been gargling gravel for a decade. Jones smiled and took his hand. Doing good, sir, he said, with an extremely firm handshake. I'm Jones, and this is my good friend Watkins. Pleasure to meet y'all, Buddy replied with a toothy grin. Just do me a favor and drop that sir bullshit. My friends call me Buddy, and since I'm trusting you to watch my ass out there, I'm gonna go ahead and put you in the friend category. Watkins nodded as he shook his hand. You got it, Buddy. So, you've been driving long? Jones asked. Buddy shrugged. Ten years, give or take, he replied, appraising his two new younger friends. Which, I'm guessing is longer than you two boys have even been in the military. The soldiers shared a chuckle. Yeah, we've been in about three years now, Watkins confirmed. Buddy crossed his beefy arms. Seen combat? Jones shook his head. We've been stateside our entire career, he admitted, and then held up a finger. However, we have seen a fair amount of action the last few weeks. Well, you're still standing tall, so you must not be half bad at it, the driver drawled with a grin. I can work with that. The captain wandered back over to the trio. Gentlemen, are you ready to get your mission details? He asked. The two soldiers turned towards him, standing at attention. Yes, sir, they declared in unison. The captain quickly waved them down, putting them at ease, and Buddy casually stood to listen, hands on his hips. You three are going to be headed to an old casino in Lula, Mississippi, Holt explained. It's about 175 miles straight up Highway 61. From the looks of it, the drive should be nice and simple, with only a couple of moderately sized towns that you'll be passing through. He pulled out a printout of the casino, with a large mass circled in the parking lot. Well, we haven't had contact with anyone inside, he trailed off, shaking his head, and made air quotes with his finger. The experts in D.C., have concluded there are survivors in there based on the amount of zombies in the parking lot. He tossed the printout on the table behind him and held out his hands, palms up. How did they figure that? He asked. Fuck if I know, but they ordered me to send supplies there, and you boys drew the short straw. Your mission is to get on site, clear out the horde, deliver the goods, 
and come back for your next load. Any questions? Watkins raised his hand. Yeah, I have one, he said slowly. How are the three of us supposed to clear out several hundred zombies? The captain pointed to Jones. Can you shoot? Yeah, the soldier replied with a nod. Holt pointed to Watkins. Can you shoot? The soldier simply nodded, knowing where this was going. The captain turned to Buddy. What the hell, can you shoot? Of course I can, the driver replied, puffing out his chest a bit. There's your answer, Holt continued, turning back to Watkins. Oh, and there's 20,000 rounds of ammo in the back of the truck, so even if you are mediocre at it, you shouldn't have a problem. Jones grinned. Good enough for me. Any other questions? The captain asked. Buddy raised a hand. How's my fuel situation? Glad you asked, Holt replied, wagging a finger at him. We upgraded your rig so you have dual tanks now. Should be able to easily pull 600 miles on a single fill-up. More than enough to get you there and back. We'll be airdropping strike teams along the interstates to secure truck stops for the longer runs. But that's next week's problem. Appreciate the upgrade, Buddy replied with a nod and then smirked. So you guys just gonna mail me a bill? Holt chuckled. It'll be in the mail along with your paycheck. They shared a laugh, and then he raised his chin. Any other questions? The group all shook their heads, and he raised a hand, rolling it above his head. All right then, daylight's burning, get to it. The group headed towards the doors at the back of the room, and Buddy stepped between the two soldiers, clapping them each on their shoulders. What do you say, boys? He bellowed with a grin. Let's hit the road. Chapter Three The transport truck rumbled down the rural highway, Buddy at the helm. Trees lined the mostly clear road, occasionally breaking open to reveal vast, empty fields. Man, I can't imagine living in the middle of nowhere like this, Watkins said, as he watched the nothingness roll by. Jones shrugged. Ah, oh, no, it ain't so bad, he said. Clean country air, no light pollution so you can see all the stars at night. Driving an hour each way to go to the grocery store or get takeout food, Watkins countered. Six women in town that you have to compete with their brothers to date. The three of them laughed at that one, and Jones turned to the driver. What about you, man? He asked. Could you live in a small country town? Buddy cocked his head from side to side. You know, I spend a lot of time in small towns, he said. The motels are a lot cheaper to stay in, so I did it to save money. A lot of them have a quaintness to them. Some small mom and pop restaurants have the best food you'll ever eat. Cost of living is low, so you can get a huge house. I mean, if you're married and introverted, it can work quite well for you. Jones raised an eyebrow. Not sure I got an answer there. Does sound like you enjoyed the experience, though, Watkins added. Buddy shrugged. Yeah, for a night, he admitted. If I had to live in one of these places, I would have slit my wrists years ago. I need action in my life, especially when I was younger. He winked at them. Action, huh? Jones asked, a smile breaking out on his face. What was your poison? Buddy grinned. Motorcycles, he sighed wistfully. Motorcycles, huh? Watkins nodded thoughtfully. Seems like that living in a rural area would be great for that. Lots of open space to ride. The driver chuckled, shaking his head. When I say motorcycles, it was really more about building them, he explained. My contemporaries and I usually only rode them down to the bar. Contemporaries? Jones held up a hand. Is that a fancy word for gang? Buddy ran his tongue over his teeth. Yeah, that would be a fair description of us, he said, turning his heavily tattooed arm towards them in the sunlight. I mean, we weren't the Hell's Angels or anything, but we were a bit rough around the edges for sure. You get into some ruckuses? Watkins asked. The driver chuckled again. You could call it that. So what happened? Jones pressed, shifting excitedly in his seat. Bar brawl? You steal another man's woman? All trace of amusement dropped from Buddy's face. 
I beat a man half to death with a tire iron. The soldiers stared at him, waiting for him to start laughing or tease them for falling for his obvious joke. But it didn't come. He simply kept staring at the road as he drove. Beat a man half to death with a tire iron, Watkins repeated slowly. Buddy sighed. Yeah, we were at the bar, and he started insulting my woman, which I took offense to, he began. The bartender said to take it outside, and the guy did. I just sat and finished my drink, thinking he blew it off. As soon as we stepped outside, he jumped us and ended up hitting my woman. I shoved him to the ground, grabbed a tire iron out of the back of a truck in the parking lot, and beat the ever-loving fuck out of him. That sounds like self-defense, Jones piped up. Buddy nodded. I thought so, he replied. My lawyer thought so, but his brother, the local district attorney, disagreed with our assessment. Watkins' eyes widened, and he let out a low whistle. Wow, man, that sucks. What happened? Took a plea deal, Buddy replied. Nine months inside and a chunk of change out of my pocket. Old lady left during that time, saying something about my temper being more than she could handle, didn't really have much left once I got out, so started truck driving. Figured if I was alone, I might as well see the country. Plus, being on the road keeps me out of trouble. He reached back behind his seat and pulled out a tire iron, clanging it against the floor behind them, causing the two soldiers to jump at the sudden noise. But just in case trouble finds me, he said with a grin, I'm ready for it. Jones and Watkins laughed, though it was a little strained. They turned front just in time to see a sign boasting, Cleveland, Mississippi, two miles. Jones pulled out his map and flattened it in his lap, noting that there was a large circle around the town. Might want to slow up a bit, he suggested. Buddy eased off the gas a bit. Is this one of our potential trouble spots, he asked. Biggest one, actually, Jones replied. Town of 11,000, give or take, so it could potentially be bad. Watkins took a deep breath. Or it could potentially be empty, he said. Been almost three weeks since this started, so a lot of those things could have wandered off by now. Or they could be hanging out just waiting on us to give them a drive-up buffet, Jones quipped. Buddy eased off the gas a little more. If it's all the same to you boys, I'm gonna assume the worst and proceed like that, he drawled. Yeah, that's a good call, Watkins agreed. The three travelers tense as they approached the town of Cleveland. Chapter four. The truck inched down the highway at 15 miles per hour. The inhabitants of the cab kept their eyes peeled for trouble, but the road was completely clear, even of vehicles. You'd figure in a town this size that there would be a wrecked car or two on the highway, Watkins mused, voice low. There was no need to whisper, but it simply felt right, as if there were an eerie air over the town. Buddy nodded. Yep, he agreed. That's what concerns me. Got some movement over here, Jones said, motioning out the passenger window. Watkins glanced over, noting a few dozen zombies milling about in the yards and down a side street, several blocks away. Bad? Buddy asked. Jones shook his head. Nah, stragglers, he replied. Nothing we can't handle if it comes to it. The truck suddenly slowed to a snail's pace as Buddy rode the brakes, and the soldiers faced front, on alert. What is it? Watkins asked. Buddy pointed to a side street coming up. Look for yourself, he said. There was a makeshift barricade at the end of the street, Used cars piled up. If that isn't deliberate, that's one hell of a coincidence that they wrecked like that, Watkins said. Jones shook his head. Pretty sure it's not a coincidence. Across the road on the other side was a similar barricade, and as they looked ahead, more cars shone at every intersection. Keep your eyes open, we might not be alone here, Buddy said. The two soldiers swallowed hard, it was one thing to shoot at a walking corpse, but firing at a living human being was something else entirely. As they passed barricade after barricade, 
It almost felt like they were being tunneled somewhere. I'm not a fan of this, Buddy finally said. Jones, get on that map and find us an alternate way out of town. If there's a side street that's open, it might be good to take it. Jones nodded, flattening out his map again. On it. He poured over the paper. However, with such a small town and the marker circle around it, it was difficult to make out all of the little streets. As the truck approached the center of town, Buddy braked nearly to a stop. And the line, he muttered. Jones looked up, seeing the major roadblock ahead, half a dozen cars across the street to keep them from driving any further. You find us another way around, Jones? Watkins asked, flexing his fingers in his nervousness. His friend scratched the back of his head. Yeah, but it requires us to turn on this road. Moot point, Buddy replied. Only option is to see if we can move them cars. If no, we're gonna be driving in reverse for quite a while. He stopped the truck and reached behind him for his tire iron. The soldiers looked at each other, and then Jones stuffed his map back in his pocket. They jumped down from the passenger's side, slinging rifles over their shoulders and readying their sidearms. The town was eerily quiet. No bodies, living or dead. No cars outside of the roadblock. Not even a bird chirping. This is just fucked up, man, Jones said, voice almost a whisper. Where the hell is everybody? Watkins shook his head. Don't know, man, he said, shoulders tense. Maybe whoever was here set this up to keep the zombies out, then got ran out. I mean, it's been weeks. A lot can happen in that time. I don't really care what the reason is, Buddy barked. I just want to clear this so we can get back on the road. Jones nodded like a bobblehead. Man's got a valid point there. The trio approached the barricade, which was three cars lined up bumper to bumper, and three more cars behind them, staggered to reinforce the spaces between the first row. Buddy knelt down, grunting when he realized that all of the tires had been slashed. Looks like pushing them out of the way isn't an option, he muttered. How's the back row looking? The soldiers hopped over the cars, sliding down the other side of the barricade to inspect the second row. Tires are slashed on these too, Jones reported from his end. Watkins nodded from the far side. Mine too. You think your rig can just plow through them? Jones asked, straightening up. Buddy shook his head. Not without risking the engine, he replied. I don't know about you two, but I'm not exactly keen on hiking through the apocalyptic wasteland. Not real high up on my list either, Watkins added. Jones laced his fingers around the back of his head, taking a deep breath. So what else can we do? Buddy knelt down and looked under the center car, rummaging and yanking around in the undercarriage. Hang tight, he said as he straightened back up. I got an idea. I think I have some chain on the truck. He motioned to the car. If we can hook it up to the front of this, I could pull it out of the way. Gonna be a pain in the ass, but we should be able to clear it, assuming I have what we need. He turned and sauntered back towards the transport. Yeah, Jones, Watkins said, sarcasm evident in his voice. This is a whole lot better than hanging out in a powered casino hotel for a night. His friends scoffed as they kept a close eye on the side streets. Come on now, can't nothing beat fresh air. Hundred bucks at the blackjack table says otherwise, Watkins quipped. Jones nodded. Yeah, you're right, he agreed. And Captain Holt seems like the type of guy who would. A gunshot cracked in the distance and Jones froze as his gut erupted in white-hot pain. He looked down at the blood pouring from his side and collapsed to the asphalt in a heap. Jones, Watkins screamed, diving for his friend. He knelt beside him, dropping his gun and pressing his palms against the wound. Don't worry, I got you. I got you, man, it's okay. His words died on his lips as a bullet ripped through his eye socket spraying blood and brain matter all over Jones. Watkins, fuck, he gasped, trying to hold his wound shut as his friend's body hit the ground with a blood-soaked, wet smack. Come on, man, come on, you're gonna be okay. His voice was weak at the unmoving body of his fallen friend, 
and tears stung the corners of his eyes. The pool of blood beneath him grew and grew, and the strength left his body with each waterfall over his fingers. Chapter 5 Buddy watched helplessly from behind the transport, got tightening at the cold realization that he couldn't do anything to help the two soldiers. He waited, watching four men come out of hiding from a nearby store, all holding hunting rifles. They were dressed in jeans and t-shirts, ranging in age from what looked like early 20s up to late 50s. From his vantage point, he watched as they approached the fallen soldiers, laughing and hooting and exchanging high fives. Joan's hand reached up weakly, and one of the younger of the group kicked him swiftly. The hand dropped, and more excitement rose in the men. Rage built within the hiding man, and he gripped his tire iron with white knuckles. Calm down, buddy, he thought to himself. You can't do shit if they shoot you before you get close to them. He looked around frantically, glancing over a nearby row of shops, and then looking back the way they'd come. Several zombies staggered from that direction, the next side street quite a ways away. If I run down the street and they see me, they'll pop me in the back of the head before I can get to cover, he thought bitterly, and turned back to the store nearest him. Looks like I'm going shopping. He glanced back around the truck to the group congregating over the dead soldiers, and made doubly sure they weren't paying attention to him. Without overthinking his plan, he darted across to the store, grabbing the knob and turning it. His heart sank as it caught, locked. We got a live one, somebody yelled, and a bullet whizzed by his head, punching the doorframe in front of him. Fuck this, Buddy snarled, and smashed the glass door with his tire iron. He dove inside as several more shots littered the storefront, barely missing him. He stayed low as he rushed through the racks of cheap clothing and knickknacks, the gunshots fading outside and quickly replaced by pounding feet. He reached the back of the store next to the fire exit, kneeling down beside it. He looked through a crack in the counter to watch the front door, concealing himself in the darkness. You two, go hunt him down, one of the men bellowed. We're gonna get this truck secure. Another man whined. Why do we have to do it? Because I fucking said so, the first one snapped. Now get going before I beat your ass. Before they could set foot inside, Buddy popped out the fire exit, light flooding the back of the store. He's going out the back, somebody cried as he burst into the alley. The door slammed behind him, and he took off like a shot, or at least as quick of a shot as his large frame allowed. He reached the end of the block and skidded around the corner as the fire door slammed open behind him, a shot narrowly missing his ass as he ran. He pumped his legs as fast as he could towards a residential neighborhood ahead. Gotta get to cover, he thought frantically as he tore towards the first set of houses that weren't on the main stretch of road. He needed to stay out of sight of the truck and the assholes stealing it. A zombie stumbled out from between two houses, and he whacked it immediately with a tire iron, sending it crumpling to the ground as he sprinted for the back of the house. He ducked at the back corner, checking to make sure the coast was clear before continuing. Across the street, one of the house's front door was open. There's probably a whole heap of trouble inside there, he thought bitterly, though it would be a sure thing that he could get inside without meeting a locked door and a bullet to the back of the head. Yelling erupted behind him, and he took off again, making it up the front steps of the house before shots rung out again. He dove through the door, nearly pitching over onto his face as he leapt into the living room for cover. A zombie moaned from the kitchen doorframe, and Buddy raised his tire iron, but then lowered it again. He lashed out and grabbed its arm, spinning it around. He took a fistful of its shirt right in the middle of its back, and hooked his other hand into the back of its jeans, holding it at arm's length. The creature flailed about, attempting to reach around to grab at the fresh meat, but unable to do so. Buddy backed into the kitchen, away from the front door while holding his undead shield in front of him. He took a knee behind it, laying in wait. The men reached the house and split as soon as they came through the door. One entered the living room, and Buddy thrust forward with all of his strength, pressing the zombie into his attacker. 
His opponent fired, the bullet tearing through the ghoul's torso and narrowly missing Buddy's arm. He pressed harder, and the man's arms gave out, the zombie's mouth latching onto his shoulder. He screamed, and blood splattered across the wallpaper as Buddy shoved them both to the living room floor. The man in the hallway struggled with the bolt on his hunting rifle, managing to finally load around and firing. The zombie's head exploded, and he ran forward to help his fallen friend. Buddy leapt in behind him and brought the tire iron down on his skull, the limp body falling over his wounded comrade. Chest heaving, Buddy kicked the guy's leg to make sure he was fully out. Yeah, you're taking a nap for a bit, he said. The bitten man whined and moaned, struggling beneath the combined weight of the zombie and his unconscious friend. He scrabbled with one hand for his rifle, but Buddy stepped over and pressed his boot down on the guy's flexing digits. Looks like we're gonna have a nice chat here, he said, kneeling down and putting his full weight on his prisoner's hand. How long one is completely up to you. If you don't wanna bleed out, I'd suggest you be forthcoming. The man hissed with pain. Fuck you. Not off to a great start there, Buddy said, clucking his tongue. I'll make you a deal, though. Tell me what I wanna know and I'll end you quick. Don't talk, and well, you're gonna sit and bleed for a while while I go looking in the kitchen for some salt or lemon juice. The man spat a stream of blood, but it didn't go far enough to hit his captor. I'm not telling you shit, he rasped. Fuck you and your friends. Buddy patted the man on the chest a few times, and then stood up, kicking the rifle away from him. He grabbed his ankle and dragged him into the kitchen, his lolling head bonking around as they went. He dropped the leg with a thud on the linoleum and began rifling through the cabinets in search of something painful to help the man speak. Do whatever you want, the guy groaned. I'm not saying shit. Buddy grunted as he found the cabinets bare. He looked around the room for any ideas and then focused on a hook by the back door. He headed over and grabbed a chain leash connected to a large dog collar. That's fine, he drawled as he turned around. You don't have to talk, but you're gonna help me get your friend to talk. Chapter six. The concussed man slowly regained consciousness from the vicious tire iron blow to the face. His eyes fluttered open, full of grogginess and pain, confusion as he tried to get a sense of his surroundings. Hey man, did you get him? He slurred. Hey. I said, did he stopped talking when he realized he couldn't move. His hands were secured behind his back, his legs together and stretched out in front of him. What the fuck is this? He struggled some more, adrenaline bringing him more alertness, and then looked up in fear at his buddy laying face down in a pool of blood. There was a collar around the corpse's neck, attached to a chain which ran through a hole in the closed door behind him. What the- what is this? The restrained man lapsed into panicked gibberish, his mouth open and closing, words garbled. There was a knock at the door. You're gonna need to calm down if you wanna survive the next five minutes, Buddy said calmly from the other side. What? The restrained man demanded, finding his words. Who are you? What do you want? Buddy rattled the chain a little. Well, I'm the man whose friends you killed. I'm the man who you thought it was a good idea to shoot at. That wasn't a good idea. And what I want is information. I don't know anything, the man cried, face pale with panic. Buddy rattled the chain again. Oh, I bet you know a whole lot more than you think you do. But I, I swear, the man stammered between gasps. I swear, I don't know anything. Buddy clucked his tongue. Let's find out. He said, first off, how many of you are there? I'll tell you, the man said hoarsely, focusing on the corpse. But you have to help my friend first. Buddy swung the chain so that it moved in a loop like a skipping rope. Your friend is beyond helping, he drawled. I'd start focusing on my own survival if I were you. He's been out of it a while. Not going to be long before he wants to pay you a visit. 
Tell me the truth, and I'll keep a good tight hold on his leash. Lie to me, and well. He let go of the chain, letting it go limp. The man took in a series of panicked, sharp gasps. Okay, okay, he stuttered. There's 12 of us. Including you and your friend, Buddy asked. His prisoner nodded frantically. Yes, yes, only 12, including us. What are you doing in this town, Buddy demanded. We came here for supplies, man. His forehead shone with sweat. We bit off more than we could chew, though. Started with 30, but ended with a dozen. We've been scavenging for weeks, but hit the mother load here. Stocked stores, no survivors, and most of those things south of downtown. Buddy furrowed his brow. So you just blocked them off and called it a day? Pretty much, man, the guy replied immediately. And then his eyes widened as the corpse began to stir. Oh God, oh God, he thrashed against his restraints. Buddy pulled the chain tight, keeping a good hold on the zombie as it moaned back to life. Relax, I got him. The creature looked around, and then its roomy eyes fixed on the restrained man, and it rushed him. The guy screamed as the ghoul stopped two feet away from his legs, pulled back by his captor. You're all right, Buddy drawled. Stop your crying. He waited for his prisoner to simmer to a whimper. We're almost done now, he continued. You're doing good. Just have a few more questions for you. The man finally regained his composure, struggling to steady his breathing. What else do you want to know? Where are your friends at now, Buddy asked. His prisoner licked his lips. If, he stammered, if you let me go, I'll gladly take you right to them. Buddy tisked his displeasure, letting go of the chain a bit, letting the snarling zombie get a foot closer to the man who was now screeching. You were doing so well there, the truck driver cooed. Okay, okay, the guy cried. They're at the hospital at the north end of town. It's straight up the highway, about six blocks up on the left. Pull him back, man. Buddy kept a tight hold, but didn't pull back. How many zombies up there? Should be next to nothing, the guy yelled. We cleared him out and put barricades up. Come on, man. Buddy drummed his fingers on the door. Any guard posts? Not until you get to the hospital, his prisoner said, unable to tear his eyes away from the hungry creature. Usually someone on watch inside. He paused a minute and then licked his lips. You've done real good, pal, he said finally. But I have one final question. Answer it right and you live to see another day. The zombie thrashed and moaned and clawed, bloody spittle flying everywhere. Okay, the prisoner urged, squirming. Buddy glared through the hole in the door. Why did you kill my two friends? The restrained man went pale as a sheet. I, uh, I mean, he stammered. It wasn't me. It was Johnny Ray. He's the one that fired and made the rest of us do it too. Johnny Ray, huh? Buddy mused. Is he the ringleader? Yeah, yeah, he's in charge, the guy screamed. He killed your friends. He's the one you want. Buddy pursed his lips for a moment. I'll be sure to send your regards then, he said, and let go of the chain. The ghoul lunged forward, stumbling and falling onto the prisoner's legs taking a huge bite out of his calf. The man screamed as the zombie gnawed at him, moving up to the exposed skin of his neck. Buddy watched as the last bit of life drained from his prisoner's eyes, and then took a deep breath. He sat in the hallway for a moment, and then pulled himself up to a standing. He checked the makeshift lock he'd made by tying a bedsheet to the knob and securing it to a bed across the hall. He thought it was unlikely that the zombie would be able to open the door towards itself, but with a runner, he didn't want to risk it. Buddy walked into the living room, the door now shut and secured. He glanced outside, making sure there weren't any reinforcements on the way, and after a few moments of silence, he flopped down on the couch. What the fuck are you gonna do now, buddy? He asked himself, rubbing his forehead. It's ten against one. They have the firepower, the manpower, and the terrain advantage. What have you got?
He contemplated for a moment, and then smiled, shaking his head. You have the entire force of the US military at your back. You can get back to them, secure a strike force, and come render some red, white, and blue foot up your ass justice. He rode that pride for a moment, before swallowing hard, his smile fading. Of course, you're a hundred miles from the base on foot, and as soon as they realize their friends are dead, they'll just pack up the trailer and head out to the next town. He scrubbed his hands down his face. And those goods are all kinds of scarce. Whole point of this operation was to help out innocent survivors, and not these murderous, greedy assholes. He looked over at the corner, seeing the fallen hunting rifle and handgun. He took a deep breath and let it out slowly as he got to his feet. God damn it, he groaned. Okay, looks like I'm gonna have to save the day by murdering a bunch of pricks. Chapter seven. Buddy exited the house and cautiously moved through the yard towards the cross street. He looked behind a bush to make sure it was vacant before nestling himself between it and the brick wall for cover. He peered up and down the street, making sure nobody was out looking for him. He knew it was only a matter of time before they went looking for their missing friends, but hoped that it wasn't this soon. With the road clear, he contemplated his next move. He didn't have a map, as it had gone down with poor Jones. All he had was a general direction he needed to travel in. Might not be a bad idea to get a few blocks away from the main highway, he thought. If somebody comes looking, they'll probably be heading that way. He dove out from cover and darted across the street, running through the yards rather than the road, hoping that if somebody did turn his way, that he'd be obstructed by the lush trees. He ran for several blocks, with only the occasional zombie popping up, but easy to avoid. At the next intersection, he paused behind a tree to look up the street. It was fairly empty, with only a handful of zombies spread out across it. Looks like a straight shot up to the center of town, he thought. No roadblock, so it doesn't look like they're worried about this area. He broke cover and started heading north, figuring it's only a few blocks to reach the main street through town. As he cleared the first block, the handful of zombies up ahead had grown, moving from an easily manageable cluster to a group of potential hazard. Well, buddy, you can backtrack and hope another road is easier, he thought, or you can just man up and deal with them. He shoved the handgun into the back waistband of his pants and pulled the tire iron from his belt loop. He tapped it against his palm a few times, psyching himself up for battle. He took a deep breath and then casually walked up to the zombies. There were seven of them, spaced apart by several feet, except for the back trio that moved nearly shoulder to shoulder. He stepped up to the first one, a tall, lanky ghoul in a bloody work jumpsuit, and swung hard cracking it in the side of the head. Before the corpse hit the asphalt, he dove forward, smacking down two young women, dropping them just as easily. This might not be so bad after all, he thought, and whirled on the final solo zombie, a teenage boy in a torn rock shirt. He hesitated a moment, a flash of sadness at the ripe young age of this kid before he met his fate. Then he slammed his weapon down on the zombie's head, turning to the lumbering trio ahead. As he prepared to take them on, there was a rustling from a nearby house. He glanced to the right and saw several more creatures emerging from the backyard. Fuck, it's not your job to clean up this town, he thought frantically. More important things to do, so get to it. Buddy reached down and picked up the lifeless teenage corpse, gripping it by the belt and collar, and then rushed the trio of zombies. He threw the small body, knocking his opponents over like rag dolls and then skirted them, taking off towards the next street. He moved at a brisk pace, trying not to exert too much energy, but not wanting to dawdle either. As he glanced behind him, he was glad to note that the still moving dead were losing ground at a safe distance. He paused at the next side street, peering around the corner to see a dead end into a row of shops. I've gotta be close to the main strip now, he thought. That looks like the shop I ran through. He jogged to the next intersection, skidding to a stop at the sound of moaning from just around the corner. Great, now what? 
He crept as silently as he could to the corner, pressing his back against the wall and peeking slightly around the brick. His gut dropped like a stone at the grisly barricade ahead. He stepped out to survey the scene. There was a trio of cars parked bumper to bumper, each with several spiked posts coming out of it. At the end of a few of them were impaled zombies, apparently having walked into them, trapped and flailing and confused. The spiked ghouls tried to turn towards him, moaning and thrashing, but were unable to move off of the posts holding them hostage. Well, I'd like to think this is the worst thing I'm gonna see today, he thought bitterly, but looked past the barricade to see two familiar dead bodies sprawled in the street. But that ship has already sailed. He hopped over the cars and began walking towards his friends, glancing back briefly to make sure the trapped zombies were pushing themselves further into their trap. He drew the handgun, readying it in case of unwanted company. This is a really stupid idea, buddy, he chastised himself. You need to stay off the main road. He shook his head. But these boys deserve better than this, and nobody else is gonna give it to them except you. Plus, you may get to run into one of the assholes who did that to them, and their spirits might enjoy watching you whip their asses. He walked closely against the north side buildings, trying to give himself just a tiny bit of cover. As he approached the main intersection, his muscles tensed up, expecting a fight. The road was clear in both directions, but he focused intently on the stores across the street. The corner store, an appliance shop, had a swinging door that danced a bit with the breeze. Might be wise to check that out, he thought, and gripped the gun tightly. He walked across the street, aiming directly at the store, and chanced a few quick glances at the other stores, though they appeared to be locked down. When he reached the door, he gently pushed it open to minimize the sound. Nothing immediately jumped out at him, but he swept the store anyway to allow his muscles to relax a little. It was mostly large appliances with some yard maintenance items, refrigerators, stoves, lawnmowers, and the like. One of the center floor displays had a deep freezer straight out of the 50s. A big sign hanging above it boasted, where it all began. He took a moment to admire it, running his hand over the pasty blue freezer. That brings back some memories, he thought. Haven't seen one of these since my cousin nearly froze to death after getting stuck in it playing hide and seek. He chuckled under his breath. To his credit, he did win that round. Buddy shook his head, clearing his head and returning to reality. With the building cleared, he headed back outside. He moved slowly to his dead friends, who had been stripped down to their boxers, leaving only their dog tags behind. The truck was gone. Where the hell did they take my rig? He wondered. Maybe they have a road that isn't barricaded. If it isn't at the hospital, this is gonna be one hell of a long day. He knelt down next to the bodies, swallowing hard at their young, marred faces. Fucking savages, taking every single thing from these boys. He reached over and popped off their dog tags, so he could at least return them to Captain Holt. He put them in his pocket and then patted each kid on the chest. Hope you boys find some peace, he murmured. Don't worry, I'll make sure to exact a little revenge in your honor. A car engine rumbled in the distance, and he leapt to his feet. Move, man, move. He tore for the appliance store, ducking inside and hiding in the darkness. He peered through the sliver of space between the door and frame, keeping an eye on the barricade. Before long, a car pulled up, parking on the south side of the blockage. Two men got out of the car, and they didn't look like any of the original group that had shot his friends. Their mouths moved, and he could hear chattering noise, but couldn't make out what they were saying. They hopped the barricade and headed over to the soldiers, pausing to give them a few kicks. Buddy took a few ragged breaths, trying to calm his rage. Don't be stupid, he told himself firmly. You come out now and they're gonna have a great chance of taking you out with those hunting rifles. Plus a gun battle will alert their friends. Two on one is bad enough, but 10 on one is something you ain't walking away from. He closed his eyes for a moment, steadying his racing heart, and then opened them again, watching the men head up the road towards him. As they grew closer, he could make out what they were saying. 
I bet you that trucker pissed himself while he ran away, one of them said. The other held up a fist. Yeah, there's no chance he's still around. Still a little concerning that we didn't find Ricky and George, the first guy said, hand on his rifle. The second one waved his hand noncommittally. Eh, you know them. They're probably getting drunk at one of the houses. I mean, they took out two military pussies, his friend continued. So I guess they're entitled to it. As they cackled together, Buddy struggled with his emotions. Calm down, it's not worth getting into a firefight over, he repeated over and over. Their time will come. The men wandered past the store, not even bothering to look inside. I wonder what made that coon cry more, one of them asked through his mirth. The gut shot or watching his boyfriend take a shot to the face. As they cackled, Buddy's rage couldn't be contained any longer. You know what? Fuck it and fuck them. He gripped the gun tightly. There's about to be two less assholes to deal with. He stood up and pushed gently against the swinging door, gently resetting it into a closed position. He moved lightly about 10 feet behind the oblivious laughing men and aimed directly into the back of the left one's head. He pulled the trigger and the man crumpled quickly. His friend was momentarily stunned, freezing and staring dumbly down at his partner's exploded head just in time to get around in the kneecap. He screamed in agony and fell to the ground, his rifle clattering to the asphalt. Why, he shrieked, what did you do, why? Because you killed my friends, you racist piece of shit, Buddy snarled and reached down to grab the guy's hair, dragging him back into the shop. He thrashed around as much as he could with a blown out knee. He wrenched his head to the side hard, taking out a chunk of his hair and releasing his face enough to smack it into the doorframe from the kickback. You really are a fucking dumbass, you know that? Buddy teased as his prisoner gurgled blood from his now broken nose. He took a handful of his hair again, pulling him fully into the store. He slammed him against a refrigerator and got right up in his face. If you think you're having a bad day now, Buddy drawled with a sneer, and drew his tire iron, holding it up right in front of his prisoner's face. You just wait until I introduce you to my old friend here. The bloodied man whimpered and cried, snot and tears filling his face, mixing with the blood. Please, please, he slurred. I'll tell you whatever you want to know. Buddy grinned cruelly. Unfortunately for you, he said, I already know everything I want to know. He tapped the iron onto the knee wound, causing his charge to scream in pain. However, I promised my friends out there that I would exact some revenge for their deaths. And while I don't think you're the one who pulled the trigger, your attitude towards them will be enough in a pinch. He waved the tire iron in front of the wounded man's face, intensifying his whimpering. What to do, he murmured thoughtfully. What to do? Please, the man sobbed. Have mercy, I, I didn't mean what I said. Buddy snarled. Bull fucking shit you didn't, he yelled. You were laughing and mocking, you meant every single bit of it. He took a deep, ragged breath. Now the question is, what am I gonna do with you? I could get some prison justice. He wrapped his hand around the iron and thrust it back and forth in his fist a few times. But I don't want my tire iron to smell for the rest of the week. As the realization hit the man of what that meant, his eyes widened and he moaned, low in his throat. Of course, I could go old school on you and beat the ever-loving fuck out of you, Buddy continued conversationally. Which, by the way, is how I ended up in jail in the first place. But I'm getting up there in age and I still have a lot to do today. He tapped the iron on the man's leg, making him jump. He looked around, thinking, and then grinned widely when he set eyes on the big blue deep freezer. Or I could go really old school, he said with a chuckle. Oh yeah, that's the answer right there. The man was confused, wide-eyed, and terrified. What, what are you gonna do with me? You ever play hide and seek, Buddy asked. His prisoner nodded jerkily, swallowing hard, and then gagging on a mouthful of blood. Well, you're about to play again, Buddy continued. 
Only this time nobody is gonna know you're hiding. On the plus side, you're sure to win. He grinned and grabbed the guy's shirt collar, dragging him across the room. He flung open the freezer and appraised the spacious inside. All right, up you go, he grunted as he hefted the man's limp body up and into the freezer. He crumpled inside, curling up and sobbing at his fate. He stared up at his captor in terror. Hope you're not afraid of the dark, Buddy declared, and then slammed the lid down. There was immediate ruckus as soon as he did so, the guy finally finding his fight and banging on the lid, screaming to be let out. It was so muffled that it wouldn't even carry into the street. Buddy locked it, checking to make sure that it was secure, and then whistled as he headed out of the store. As he walked towards the hospital, swinging his trusty tire iron by his side, he stopped and glanced back at the other dead guy on the sidewalk. You know, if another patrol comes through, they're gonna see this and be on alert, he thought. That could be bad for you. Plus, with the way that other guy's freaking out, he could use a friend. He smirked and grabbed the corpse, dragging it inside the store. The banging and pleading continued, and he wrapped his hand around the lock release and opened the lid. Oh God, thank you, thank you, the man babbled, now completely covered in blood from head to toe from all of his thrashing. Buddy smiled. It's my pleasure, he said, putting a hand on his chest. And I apologize. If I knew you needed your friend this much, I wouldn't have left you without him. The man looked confused for a split second, before his eyes widened in terror as his dead friend flopped over the edge and landed on him, crushing him down into the freezer. No, no, please, he screamed around a mouthful of dead body. You two play nice, Buddy called, and then slammed the freezer shut again, locking it tight. He turned away from the 50s appliance and checked the ammo on his hunting rifle. He headed over to the fallen ones he'd collected and popped out the ammunition, bringing his total rounds up to eight. Could be worse, I suppose, he muttered to himself. But how in the hell are you gonna storm a hospital with eight armed people inside? You're a good shot, but being perfect is asking a lot, especially under fire, not to mention they're entrenched in their positions. He looked around the shop for something, anything he could use. As he scanned all of the stoves and fridges, he focused on a high-end lawnmower. He walked over and glanced at one of the sales tags, flipping it over for more information. He read it, and then moved on to the next one until he found what he was looking for. The last one in the row boasted, push button start, reinforced carbon steel blade, self-propelled. Buddy grinned. There it is. He pulled the lawnmower off of the display and rolled it around, making sure there were no obstructions on the wheels. He stepped into the back room, searching for some fuel. There was a small gas can in the corner, and he shook it, hearing some sloshing. As he walked back to the main showroom, he grabbed a roll of duct tape from a table. This may be the weakest idea in the history of ideas, he admitted to himself as he gassed up the lawnmower but fuck if it ain't the only one you got. Chapter Eight Buddy knelt down by his lawnmower across from the hospital, the front edge of the parking lot just across the street, with another 400 yards or so to the front entrance. He pulled out his hunting rifle and looked through the scope, surveying the front of the building. There was no movement, no signs of life or undead, Maybe that boy in the house was lying to me, he wondered. If he was, he certainly paid for it. He continued to scan the building, eventually honing in on the emergency room entrance where he found his truck. Well, what do you know? He was telling the truth after all. Still, he shot at me and killed my friends, so fuck him. Buddy took out the tape and wrapped it several times around the self-propelled handlebar. He jiggled it several times to make sure it was secure, then he sat back on his haunches for a moment, staring at it. You might as well go ahead and hit start, he thought, sighing to himself. Staring at it ain't gonna make it a better idea. Buddy shook his head and hit the starter. The lawnmower roared to life and immediately tried to jerk out of his hand. He lifted it and aimed it at the front of the hospital, 
letting it go before running across the side street to get a better vantage point. The little machine buzzed across the street, bouncing a bit when it hit the entrance to the parking lot. It took a solid minute for it to get close enough to draw some attention. Two men stepped outside as the lawnmower reached 20 yards from the front door. Buddy watched through his scope, assuming they were arguing over who should go handle it. Eventually, one of them gave in and walked over while the other looked around to see if he could find out who sent it. Buddy waited patiently for the guy to get away from the door before striking. As soon as the enemy flipped off the lawnmower, Buddy squeezed the trigger, the bullet hitting him dead in the chest and dropping him immediately. He quickly moved to aim at the guy at the door, who was frantically looking around. After a moment, he ran towards his fallen friend, and Buddy followed him with his scope. You pulled this shit on my friends, he thought bitterly. Time to return the favor. He waited until the man stopped moving and then fired. His aim was a little off, hitting him in the shoulder, but sending him to the ground to join his friend. As he screamed in pain, six men poured out of the hospital to help. They all burst out through the door, one after the other. Buddy took aim, just in time to see one of them pointing in his direction. Move, move, move. He didn't fire, opting to immediately retreat. Just as he dove away from the side of the building, it exploded with gunfire. Should have thought this through more, he chided himself. Where are you going, buddy? He darted down the street, despite the people pursuing him. Neighborhood? No, they'll flank you, he thought frantically. Side street? Same fucking problem. As a hardware store came into view ahead, he shook his head and picked up the pace. Fuck it, I'll make it work. He smashed the glass door with the butt of his rifle and ducked inside, leaving the door open. He hoped they decided to split up when they ran after him. He moved swiftly through the aisles, looking for something he could use. He grabbed a medium-sized metal wrench and swung it a couple of times to get used to the feel. Just shoot the motherfuckers as they come in, he thought to himself. No, damn it, man, think, he argued. One shot and you're burned. Hand to hand, get you a hostage, and get the hell out of Dodge. He was three aisles away from the door when it opened. He held his breath, hoping that there wouldn't be the full set of footsteps. His muscles relaxed a touch, when he was pretty sure it was only two people entering. They moved in the same direction, towards the end of his aisle. He moved towards the noise quietly, cocking his arm back, ready to strike with the wrench. He was 10 feet away when a barrel of a hunting rifle peeked around the end of the aisle. Buddy rushed forward, the noise prompting the gunman to leap around the corner. He knew he wasn't going to make it without getting shot, so he threw the wrench as hard as he could while still running. It flew through the air, hitting the man in the chest. The impact caused him to stumble back, pulling the trigger in shock. The sound reverberated deafeningly in the small space, the bullet tearing through the aisle display. The enemy behind the fallen man shoved forward to raise his own gun, but Buddy beat him to the punch, grabbing his barrel and shoving it down while slamming his shoulder into the man's chest. The weapon hit the floor, and Buddy grabbed his opponent and swung him around, throwing him into his partner like they were in a wrestling ring. The impact sent them both sprawling to the floor, and as they were getting back up, he dove forward with the tire iron. He landed a blow on one of their shoulders and kicked away the closest rifle to keep it away from reaching hands. One of them swung with his non-injured arm, catching Buddy in the side of the head. It glanced off, but still stung, driving him back a few steps. The non-injured man grabbed the wrench and rushed forward, swinging wildly. Buddy deflected the blow with his tire iron, catching his opponent in the forearm. The wrench hit the floor, and he jabbed with the iron, hitting the man in the throat and dropping him. As the man struggled to breathe, gasping for air, Buddy stepped over his writhing form to approach his friend, who had drawn a knife. He cracked a smile at the pocket knife, a mere four-inch blade. You better hit me in the jugular, or else all you're gonna do is piss me off, he drawled. The man grunted, and lunged towards him, and Buddy dodged the attempted strike easily. The man flailed wildly with the blade, movements predictable and easy to avoid. 
The man grunted in frustration and stepped back before rushing forward, screaming. Buddy sidestepped him, swinging the iron as he went by and cracked him on the back of the skull. His opponent dropped to one knee, woozy, and Buddy reared back to deliver a killing blow when the door swung open again. He's in here, somebody yelled. Buddy grunted. Shit, he huffed, and darted down an aisle as a shot rang out. The woozy man dropped to the floor as his friends flooded into the store. Buddy rushed towards the back, hoping that there was a storeroom with a back exit. As he ran, footsteps thundered in multiple directions. He drew his handgun, deciding gunshots didn't matter now that his cover was blown. As he came around the corner at the end of the aisle, another shot rang out, hitting the display just beside him, sending bits of plastic and flimsy metal flying through the air and into his tender flesh. The superficial wounds didn't hurt, but definitely pissed him off. He blindly fired down the darkened aisle, not sure if he hit anything, but damn sure that it stopped whoever was firing at him from approaching this way. He ducked behind the back counter and could make out a door in the distance to his left. That better be it, or else my last stand is gonna be in a fucking hardware store. He hit the latch release on the door, and sunlight poured in, briefly blinding his pursuers. He looked both ways, seeing a long alley with no way to hide or escape. He shoved his arm back inside, firing off a few rounds to buy himself a moment to think. You ain't fast enough to make it before they get here, he thought. You don't have the bullets to take them out either. Footsteps approached his position. Looks like it's time to bluff. Buddy pressed himself against the wall just beside the door, waiting with his handgun at the ready. He strained his ears, listening closely as footsteps approached, holding his breath in anticipation of executing this risky maneuver. He didn't have to wait long for a rifle barrel to poke out the door into the alley. As soon as it was visible, he reached out and jerked it forward, avoiding a bullet as he lashed out with his gun, jamming it into the man's throat and aiming up into his head. Why aren't you smiling, Buddy asked. You should be happy that you finally found me. Yelling erupted from behind him, various voices screaming for Buddy to drop his weapon. He stared down his hostage, a clean-shaven man that looked to be in his 30s, and the man stared right back. His friends inside continued to holler and panic. You wanna ask them to kindly shut the fuck up? Buddy asked with a smirk. I get the sense that my request wouldn't be honored. His hostage calmly rolled his eyes. Settle down, boys, I got this under control. The rabble finally quieted down, so much so that Buddy could hear footsteps running out of the store. I appreciate that, he said, inclining his head. The hostage pursed his lips. Well, I do try to be hospitable towards the guests in my town. Hospitable, huh? Buddy's eyes blazed. Is that what you call what you did to my friends when we arrived? The man shrugged, or at least as much as he was able in his predicament. Don't take it personal, he drawled. Simple fact is, you looked like you had stuff we could use, so we took it. But since we have your stuff now, I can be a little friendlier. He grimaced as the barrel of the handgun pressed harder into the tender flesh of his throat. I'd be careful now. You wouldn't want to accidentally squeeze that trigger. Without me, they'll tear you apart like a Rottweiler on a stake. If I were you, I'd be more concerned with your own safety rather than mine, Buddy warned. The man sighed, just trying to be friendly. We'll cut it out, because that's a bit disingenuous, Buddy snarled especially given how this day has gone so far. Okay, you don't want me to be nice, I won't be, the man snapped. Either put down the gun or my friends here are going to drag your scraggly looking ass back to that hospital and try out every single piece of surgery equipment on you. Buddy grinned, showing all of his teeth. See, was that so hard? So what do you want, the man asked. His captor stared him dead in the eye. Just want to talk to Johnny Ray, so I can get my truck back and get out of everybody's hair. Oh, is that all? The man replied, rolling his eyes. You want me to tell you where my wife is so you can fuck her too? Well, I'm sure she'd appreciate getting some solid pipe for the first time in years, Buddy quipped. 
I am on a bit of a timetable, so I'll have to politely decline. The man sneered. Timetable, huh? He asked. Guess you shouldn't have bothered stopping in our humble little town here. Trust me, that was the first of many things I didn't have scheduled today, Buddy admitted. Footsteps echoed in the alley, but he refused to give up his ground. Well, look at that, the man said. You spent too much time chattering away, and now you're surrounded. One of the approaching men cocked his gun. Give me your gun and nobody gets hurt, he demanded. Buddy carefully glanced back, making sure to keep most of his focus on his hostage in case he moved. The gunman had his rifle aimed right for his head, but was too far away to make a move on him. You should listen to him, the hostage said. I've known him a long time. He'll be gentle on you. You know, I met a woman at a bar once that told me she'd be gentle with me, Buddy said conversationally. I made the mistake of believing her. Twelve hours later, I woke up three counties over chained to a cheap motel bed and missing my pants. Somehow, I don't think your friend here is gonna treat me quite as well. His hostage snickered. Well, it's either that or he blows your head off. Yep, and there's a 50-50 chance that I pull this trigger as I fall to the ground, Buddy replied. So it sounds like you're a betting man. His prisoner shrugged. I am when the odds are in my favor, he replied. I may have a 50-50 chance, but you have considerably worse odds. Buddy contemplated for a moment, knowing that he was right. It definitely didn't do him much good to get his head blown off, even if he took out this asshole in the process. I think you might be right there, he admitted. The hostage smiled. Finally, some sensible words coming from you. Lay down your gun, the man behind them demanded. Buddy kept his weapon pressed hard against his hostage's lower jaw. Why don't you come and take it, he demanded. There was a long pause. You gonna come get it, or should I go ahead and blow his head off? The hostage stared at his friend, and gave as much of a nod as he could in his position. The gunman kept aiming at Buddy as he approached, inching forward. As soon as the tip of the rifle was in reach, Buddy removed the gun from his hostage's throat and held it out for the taking. As soon as the approaching man's eyes flicked to his hand, he struck. Buddy grabbed the barrel of the rifle, pulling it down and forward, causing his attacker to inadvertently squeeze the trigger. A shot rang out, which tore through the hostage's shoulder, dropping him to the ground. The recoil knocked the shooter off balance, giving Buddy a chance to aim and fire three quick shots into him. As this happened, the men on the inside of the store fired out the door, giving cover to the hostage, who dragged himself along the ground with one arm across the threshold of the door. Buddy spun and grabbed his ankle, dragging him back outside. He dropped to one knee, grabbing the back of his collar and pulling him up, using him as a human meat shield as the three other gunmen rushed out into the alleyway. As they aimed, the hostage raised his one good arm to keep them from shooting. All right, I'm done fucking around with you chuckle nuts, Buddy bellowed, eyes blazing. Take me to Johnny Ray now, or I'm gonna blow his head clean off and then start shooting at dick level until you take me out. So while you may not give a flying fuck about him, I'm gonna assume you care a great deal about your beans and franks. There was a tense moment of silence, and the men all shared confused looks before deferring to the hostage. He sighed, still holding his arm out. Go tell my brother to meet us in the parking lot, he said weakly. One of the men looked to Buddy as if for permission, and he nodded to let him know he wouldn't shoot him in the back upon retreat. He turned around and took off running towards the hospital. Brother, huh? Buddy asked. Guess that explains why your boys didn't light me up as soon as I had my gun on you. Old Johnny Ray must actually care for your well-being. His hostage chuckled, hissing at the pain in his shoulder. Well, I wouldn't go quite that far, he admitted. More like the men here don't want to find out what would happen if they let me die and had to tell them about it. I'll buy that, Buddy replied and stood up, pulling his prisoner by the collar to his feet. You two start walking, he demanded, motioning to the two remaining gunmen. So what's your name? The hostage asked as they strolled along behind the duo towards the hospital. Buddy rolled his eyes. Do you really give a shit about that? He asked. Nah, just making conversation, the man replied. 
Been stuck with the same people for three straight weeks now. Never hurts to know new people, even if they have a gun in your back. His captor clucked his tongue. Fair enough, he agreed. You can call me Buddy. I'm Jody, the hostage replied. Buddy, huh? Parents give you that name? Or did you earn it as a nickname and it just sort of stuck around? Buddy fisted his shirt a little tighter as they reached the end of the alley. Nickname, he replied. My father was a narcissistic prick of a human being, so he gave me his name when I was born. Got tired of being called Junior by everybody, and it was downright exhausting to have my father constantly telling me I wasn't living up to his name. So I said fuck his name and his expectations and started going by Buddy. Jody shook his head and then grimaced at his shoulder. Still, of all the names to pick, he went with Buddy. I was a sophomore in high school, so not exactly the prime time to be making lifelong decisions, his captor admitted. But my favorite teacher knew I hated being referred to as Junior, so he made it a point in class to call me Buddy. Resonated with me, so I ran with it. Jody chuckled. That is a surprisingly wholesome story to hear, especially given all the death going on of late. Well, figured you got shot and have to explain to your brother why half your crew is dead, so might as well throw you a bone, Buddy replied, as casual as if he were discussing the weather. Makes me feel better in case I have to put a bullet in the back of your head. Jody gulped. Chapter 9 The quartet walked across the hospital parking lot, approaching the front door. As they grew closer, the gunman from the alley walked out, with a tall, mullet-wearing redneck in ripped jeans and a Molly Hatchet t-shirt. Buddy assumed this was Johnny Ray, who looked like he was in his mid-forties, though the years hadn't treated him well by the looks of his ragged face. What in the holy hell do you want, motherfucker? The redneck roared. You're doing a great job of fucking up my high, and I don't have too many more of those to get. Buddy smirked. Running out of supplies, are you? Goddamn right I am, Johnny Ray cried. Good quality shit is hard to come by in the apocalypse. Buddy raised an eyebrow. Well, I'll be quick and to the point so you can get back to it, he replied. Just give me my truck and I'll be on my merry way. Fuck you, motherfucker, Johnny Ray snapped, pointing a thick finger at him. That is my truck now. Everything that's in there is all mine, and there's not a goddamn thing you can do about it. Well, you say that. Buddy replied and pressed the barrel of his handgun against the back of Jody's head. The wounded man held out his hands, palms out. Johnny Ray, he rasped. Now might be a good time to start negotiating. Fuck off, Jody, his brother snapped. If you and your dumbass friends could aim a rifle, he'd be dead and we'd be getting fucked up right now. Buddy cocked his head. Be that as it may, my current offer still stands, he said calmly. Give me my truck and you can go back to smoking whatever it is that you're smoking. The redneck pulled out a handgun and pointed it at him. Johnny Ray, Jody pleaded. Let's hear this man out before you go shooting. Nah, I'm done, Buddy replied with an overdramatic sigh. Everybody knows what the deal is. Give me what I want or there will be blood to clean up. The redneck shrugged. Well, hell, when you put it that way, I might as well take care of you right now, he declared. And if Jody don't make it, it just means more of the good shit for the rest of us. He chuckled as he cocked the hammer of his gun. At least for an hour or two, Buddy replied with a little shrug. Johnny Ray narrowed his eyes. What the fuck you talking about? Your boys here did kill two high-ranking military members, Buddy reminded him. Or didn't you know that? Yeah, so, the redneck demanded. Buddy shrugged again. Well, their friends are on the way to exact some revenge. Bullshit, Johnny Ray drawled, dragging out the word. You ain't got no radio on you? The truck driver cocked his head. Very true, he admitted. However, one of the houses I was hiding out in down south of here sure did have one. Funny thing about small rural towns in this country, they seem to have an overabundance of people who serve in the military, which means there's a whole lot of prepared people. From the fear flicking across the redneck's face, Buddy could tell his ruse was working. He wasn't sure if the man had family members in the military, 
or if he was just so high that the bullshit story made sense. Regardless, he was innately relieved that his bluff was working and made sure not to show it. Well, in that case, it looks like we just need to pack up and head on out, Johnny Ray finally said. We ain't giving up that truck that easily, which still leaves you up Shit's Creek, boy. Buddy raised an eyebrow. Oh, so you found the trackers, huh? The what? The redneck demanded. Buddy laughed. You hijacked a high priority military transport. Did you not think there were going to be tracking devices on there? If it goes off the designated path, they'll be sending in airstrikes to take it out. Johnny Ray paled. Airstrikes? Hell yeah, airstrikes, Buddy replied. They can't risk that falling into the wrong hands. The redneck's gun arm began to shake. Well, where are they? He demanded. How many are there? Fuck if I know, man, Buddy replied with a shrug. I'm just the driver. You think they'd tell me anything? Johnny Ray's eyes darted around in a panic. Well, what can we do? You can get me my truck and I'll be on my way. Buddy replied, when I get out of town, I'll make the call and let them know I'm good to go. The redneck began to pace back and forth, waving his gun around. He muttered to himself, hemming and hawing. Tick tock, man, Buddy prompted, tired of waiting. Okay, okay, Johnny Ray snarled, pressing the heels of his hands to his eyes. Go get his truck. The gunman beside him faltered. But... Just go get his goddamn truck, the redneck yelled. The gunman ran off towards the truck as Johnny Ray shoved his gun back into the waistband of his pants and motioned for the others to put their weapons down. All right, man, he said, taking a deep breath. You can take your truck and get out. Just call off the military and let my brother go. I'll do both once I get to the city limits, Buddy replied. The redneck growled. No, you let him go now. Can't do that, Buddy said, shaking his head. You're just gonna have to take my word for it. Johnny Ray began pacing again, clenching and unclenching his fists. It's all right, bro, Jody said gently. Buddy will take good care of me. His calm voice seemed to put the redneck at ease, and he stopped pacing. The truck rolled up beside them in the parking lot. There you go, man, there you go, Johnny Ray said waving maniacally at the vehicle. Get on out of here before the military blows us all up. Buddy nodded his head towards the building. Y'all go lock yourselves in the hospital and do it quick, he said firmly. And leave your weapons out here, just in case someone wants to get cute and fire off a shot. Do it, do it, the redneck cried, and his gunmen laid down their weapons, following him inside. As soon as the door locked, he began dragging his hostage to the cab. That was one hell of a bluff there, Jody commented. Buddy narrowed his eyes. What makes you think I'm bluffing? Just a hunch, his prisoner replied, hissing as he tried to shrug. So why didn't you call me out? Buddy asked as he opened the driver's side door. Jody pursed his lips. Self-preservation, he replied easily. You heard my asshole brother. He was willing to sacrifice me for a bigger share of the drugs. Good to know I'm not the only one with family issues, Buddy replied, and shoved him up into the cab. He got behind the wheel, continuing to aim at the man in the passenger seat. Is that necessary? Jody asked, keeping his good arm up as he got comfortable leaning against the passenger door. Buddy nodded as he popped the truck into gear with his left hand. Yep, he replied, and pulled out of the hospital parking lot, heading for the highway to go north. City limits should be just up ahead, Jody said, as they rumbled up the road. Yep, Buddy replied, and hit the gas a little harder, speeding up to 30 miles per hour. He blew right past the sign announcing the edge of the city, and his passenger swallowed hard. Um, he said, that was the city limits. The driver grinned. Then you're free to get out. Jody looked down as the ground began whipping by faster and faster. Stop the truck and I will, he demanded. Buddy cocked the hammer on his gun. Get out, or I'm gonna repaint the interior with your fucking blood, he snarled. 
You killed my friends, so don't pretend for a fucking second that our chummy conversation is going to spare you my wrath. Jody paled, eyes wide at the steely resolve in his captor's face. He put his hand on the door handle and hesitated. Road gets to four lanes in half a mile, Buddy said. Might be in your best interest to get out where you can. He revved the engine, and his passenger finally lifted the handle. Jody pushed the door open and carefully stepped down onto the step, before crouching and then taking a leap. Buddy let up on the gas and looked into the side mirror, watching as the guy's feet hit the ground, sending him toppling over himself. He smacked the pavement hard, barely moving in the road. You know you should have killed him, right? Buddy said to himself, glancing at his face in the rearview mirror. Those boys deserve justice, although we're several miles outside of town. And assuming he did survive that, he's gonna be fucked up for quite some time. So yeah, you deliver justice. He took a deep breath, focusing on the road and hitting the gas, smiling grimly. He wasn't sure if his pep talk would make him feel better in the long run, but he had a job to complete now. Chapter 10 Buddy drove along the lonely highway, finally sitting in complete silence as he moved through the rural area. His heart was heavy from the loss of the boys. Even though he'd barely known them, they had been out here risking their lives to help innocent people, and they'd been so goddamn young. He slowed the truck down as he approached a major intersection at Highway 49. He stopped at the crossroads and pulled out a map, tracing his finger along his route towards the circled waterfront casino. Another couple miles and we're there, he thought. Hopefully the sky view was a bit off on how many of those things are hanging out. He made the turn and drove towards his destination, gently allowing the truck to drive just enough to smack the few zombies milling about with the front grill. Each fragile, rotted corpse was obliterated on impact, causing him to crack a smile. It's the little things in life, he murmured. He came around a bend and slammed on the brakes, still a few hundred yards from the casino. His eyes widened as he stared at the three to four hundred strong horde of creatures packed into the parking lot, congregating at the front doors. Fuck me sideways, he breathed. If anything, the estimate was off. He sat stock still for a moment, his shell-shocked brain trying to contemplate what to do next. After a moment, he checked his side mirrors to make sure nothing was around him before getting out and heading to the back of the truck. He threw open the large sliding door and clambered up inside. There was just enough room for him to stand on the edge before the boxes and boxes of goods were piled high in front of him. Well, they said there were bullets and guns in here, he muttered. Now just gotta hope that those jack wagons didn't help themselves to them. He began opening up boxes, finding canned goods, seeds, and some building supplies. The next one was full of hundreds of granola bars. He hesitated, and then grabbed one, tearing it open. Figure I've earned one of these today, he thought as he bit into the chocolate-covered treat. He opened up a few more boxes while snacking on the delicious bar, before hitting the jackpot. He stared and smiled at a crate of military-issue sniper rifles and a few thousand rounds of ammo to go along with it. Now we're cooking, he said. He stuffed the rest of the granola bar into his mouth and grabbed a few rifles and as much ammo as he could carry. As he approached the back of the truck, there were a few zombies that had found their way over. They came chest high to the back, reaching and moaning in vain as they were too dead to climb up. Well, you boys just couldn't wait for the party to begin, huh? Buddy asked with a maniacal grin. Try this on. He stood over them and smashed down with the butt of one of the rifles, cracking their skulls one by one and dropping them. Once there was a neat little pile of unmoving corpses, he hopped down from the truck, wiped the base of the weapon clean on their clothes, and then peeked around both sides of the vehicle. The passenger side was clear. However, when he came around to the driver's side, there were three more staggering zombies. These fuckers really are everywhere, he muttered, and set down his spoils, grabbing his tire iron from his belt. He swung away like he was playing backyard baseball with the neighborhood kids. One crack, two cracks, three cracks, and they were all out. 
he gathered his weapons and came around to the front of the truck, making sure nothing else was close to him. Luckily, these had been stragglers and not the front end of a horde. He breathed a sigh of relief at the main event still at the casino. He clambered back up into the cab, pausing at the top step to toss the guns and ammo onto the roof. Then he settled into the driver's seat and picked up his radio. Can anybody in the Riverfront Casino read me? Over, he said into the first local frequency. When there was no answer, he switched to the next channel. Can anybody in the Riverfront Casino read me? Over, he repeated. Again he paused, and again there was nothing. Next channel. Can anybody in the Riverfront Casino read me? Over. Yeah, you got me, somebody replied, sounding no older than a teenager. Still there? Oh yeah, I'm still here, Buddy replied. Who am I talking to? There was a brief pause, and then the voice came back, excited. My name's Chance, sir. Buddy will be fine, he said into the radio with a chuckle. No need for that sir stuff. Sorry, Buddy, Chance replied. Give me just a minute. I, uh, I gotta go get somebody to talk to you. The driver nodded understanding that the kid was probably not at all near a position of power in the group within. Take your time, he replied gently. I'm not going anywhere. As he waited, he looked out at the sea of zombies a few hundred yards away. His mind raced, thinking about how in the hell he was going to take all of them out by himself. This would have been a job for a few military boys, but that was all moot now. Hello, buddy. A more mature-sounding voice came through the speaker. My name is Mr. Kenneth. I'm in charge of the Riverfront Casino. Are you in need of assistance? The driver smiled. Not so much there, Kenneth. I was actually sent here to help you. Sent to help us? The man replied, suspicion in his tone. By whom? Buddy took a deep breath. The U.S. military, he replied. They have these caravans being sent out all over the country to help survivors like yourself out, so I have a transfer truck filled to the ceiling with all sorts of goodies. May I ask where you are? Kenneth asked. Buddy nodded. Sure thing, I'm just around the bend on the highway, sitting in the middle of the road. If you wouldn't mind humoring me, the older man replied carefully. I'm going to send someone up a few floors to check. There are some bad actors out there and we're not exactly keen on letting them take advantage of us. Buddy smiled. Do what you gotta do, he replied. I totally get it. Ran into a few of those bad actors myself running this rig up here. I hope that you were not harmed coming to our aid, Kenneth said. The driver's face fell. Me, I'm good, he said, voice somber. Just some bumps and bruises. My two military friends, however... He trailed off, unable to tell the tale. You have my condolences, buddy, the older man said sincerely. I am truly sorry for your loss. Buddy took a deep breath and straightened his shoulders. Not your fault, he said. There's assholes all over the place. Just some bad luck that we happen to run into them. Still, Kenneth insisted, I shall keep your friends in my thoughts and prayers. Buddy scratched the back of his head. Appreciate that. There was a secondary voice in the background through the speaker, though he couldn't make out what they were saying. Well, Kenneth came back. It would appear as though your story checks out. I apologize for doubting you. Buddy shook his head. No apology necessary, he said. So, the older man prompted, do you have a plan on how to get to us? The driver clucked his tongue. Kinda hoping you have a loading dock or something. We do, Kenneth dragged out the word. Unfortunately, it requires moving through the mass of creatures at our front door. Buddy sighed. I was afraid you were gonna say that. Do you think your truck is strong enough to push through them? The older man asked. The driver cocked his head back and forth. Fifty-fifty on that, he admitted. As all it would take is one zombie getting caught up in the wheel well, and I would be trapped. Is there maybe a way you can pull them away from the door? Kenneth suggested. Buddy nodded. Oh, without a doubt, he replied. 
I got a couple of rifles and enough ammo to take half the state out. Only downside is that I'm only a halfway decent shot. So once I get going, I'm gonna be lucky to take half of them out before they get to the truck. If you can get that far, I believe we can help you, Kenneth replied firmly. Only thing that I ask is that once you see my people, that you relegate your fire away from them. Buddy nodded again. No problem there, he agreed. You just let me know when your people are ready, and I'll get to firing. They'll be ready on your call, the older man countered. Fire at will, and we will see you soon. The driver took a deep breath. Ten four, he replied. Out. He tossed the radio down and shook out his hands, psyching himself out for this new battle. It's gonna be okay, buddy, he said to himself. Hardest part is gonna be climbing up on top of this big bitch. Chapter 11 Buddy knelt down on top of the transport, the metal a bit hot to the touch after baking in the sun all day. He took off his button-down overshirt and laid it down to give him a little bit of a barrier from the hot roof. Eh, I'll dry clean it later, he joked to himself as he organized his supplies. He set the boxes of bullets beside him, as well as the backup rifle. They were bolt-action rifles with a five-bullet capacity, so reloading would be slow and tedious. He took a deep breath as he raised up his active weapon and looked through the scope, making a few adjustments to dial them in properly. Well, here goes nothing, he muttered, and aimed towards the horde. He struggled to find a clear head through the mass of creatures. At this range, it was difficult to single out one that was in the back row. Finally, he gave up, knowing that in the grand scheme of things, it didn't much matter, and squeezed the trigger. He hadn't been expecting kickback from a military-grade rifle and fumbled a little from the force of it. This rattled the scope, and he couldn't see where the bullet had impacted. He gathered himself and looked down range through the scope, noting that several zombies had turned and begun moving in his direction. Having some faces to aim at will certainly help, he murmured, and swung his aim across the turning heads. With the horde breaking up a little, at least towards the back, he was able to find a target's head and fire, ripping a hole straight through it. Yeah, he cheered for himself and bolted a new round to search for a new target. One after another, three more creatures dropped before he had to pause and reload. He quickly slapped the rounds into the rifle and then looked through the scope again to scan the area. Holy shit, he breathed at the sight of nearly half of the horde moving towards him. He knew that he was safe that it would be okay that he was on top of the truck, but the sheer number of flesh-eating monsters lumbering towards him was terrifying nonetheless. He snapped out of his shock and went into overdrive, quickly aiming and firing, not bothering to wait to see if the round struck their targets before moving on to the next and firing. If this had been sniper training, his instructor would have certainly pulled him off of the line for excessive firing. After four sets of rounds, he took a quick breath as he reloaded. The horde had moved a hundred yards closer to him at least, closing half of the gap between them in a matter of minutes. Hope they've got some badasses in that casino, because I'm gonna need them, he said, and took a deep breath, lining up his next shot. He fired into the closest zombies to him, hoping to slow them down. After ten more shots, he checked the front doors of the casino, noting that just about every single zombie had lost interest in the building and was heading his way. All right, Kenneth, he muttered. Time for you to work your magic. He slapped five more rounds into the rifle and aimed, able to take out four more with his next burst of fire. As he reloaded, the telltale sound of hands smacking against metal reverberated up to him. Hey, watch the paint job, asshole, he bellowed, and started cracking off shots at the zombies smacking against the front of the truck. The front edge of the horde began to surround the vehicle, a moaning, rank-smelling mass of writhing limbs, all reaching for him. Buddy loaded in another set of rounds and looked back to the casino, just in time to see the doors open up. It was hard to make out with the naked eye what was happening, so he raised the scope again. Several people rushed out, carrying what appeared to be hotel doors, setting up a defensive perimeter just outside the door. Behind them were several people armed with makeshift spears. 
even as the zombies surrounded him. But he watched with amazement as the casino dwellers systematically took out the ghouls with their spears from behind. One by one, they dropped them with precise jabs to the head, moving forward as a unit. They're like some discount Spartans, Buddy muttered to himself. Fucking genius right there. He snapped back into realization when he realized the back end of the horde was turning around, drawn by the noise of their footsteps. Shit, back on the clock, he said. He aimed at some zombies about halfway between the two groups and fired, hoping that the combination of the gunfire and the creature dropping would keep the attention on him. As he fired a few quick shots, he looked up to see his plan was working. That's right, motherfuckers, he bellowed. Come and get me. He squeezed off three more rounds before reloading. He walked over to the side of his truck and looked straight down. The zombies were stacked ten deep on that side, reaching up in a futile attempt to get at him. Gonna need longer arms than that, fuckers, he called down brightly. He aimed almost straight down, taking careful aim and firing one by one, clearing out an entire line of creatures in a matter of seconds. He reloaded a few more times and repeated the process, clearing out a sizable portion of the corpses on that side. He turned his attention back towards the discount Spartans, watching the dozen or so people working as a single unit, moving forward with gusto and quickly dispatching every ghoul that dared step near them. They'd already cleared half the distance between the casino and the truck, leaving a pile of bodies in their wake. Buddy cracked off another batch of five rounds, aiming straight down again on the side of the truck, leaving only a smattering of creatures on that side. He checked the other side, estimating about 50 ghouls still standing, not including the few dozen drawn to the front grill. As he reloaded, he watched the casino group set up in the middle of the road, spreading out to cover two entire lanes. They were about 30 yards away from the truck zombies, and one of them gave a wave. Buddy returned the gesture, raising his gun in the air to let them know he was good to go for the final assault. Soon everybody in the Spartan line let out a collective yell, emulating the ancient warriors they seemed to be paying homage to. The bulk of the zombies lost interest in the truck and broke away, shambling back towards the screaming spear holders. Buddy quickly aimed at the one still relatively close to him, but not in the line of fire of his new comrades. He fired quickly but deliberately, dropping them one right after the other. Rather than reload, he dropped the gun and grabbed the other rifle so that he could quickly pick off another five before clicking empty. As he reloaded, the zombies were pretty much in a line, several standing shoulder to shoulder and moving towards the live humans on the road. All Buddy could do was stand there, holding his gun slack, watching in amazement as his new friends struck them down one by one, all while the door holders created an impenetrable barrier to hold them at bay. Within a matter of minutes, the job was done. Black, coagulated blood flowed through the streets as corpses baked on the blacktop. A few of the spearmen stepped cautiously over the dead, jabbing into any of the zombies that had a spark of unlife remaining. A young teenage girl approached the truck, chocolate skin glistening in the sun. She put a hand over her eyes and squinted up at him. Hey, that's some fine shooting there, she said. Buddy grinned down at her. Appreciate it. You need a hand getting down from there, she asked. He held up his finger and then grabbed the rifles, laying down on the edge of the truck. She came over and grabbed them from him, setting them on the ground and watching with an amused smile on her face as he struggled to slide down from the roof of the cab down to the ground. Gonna go out on a limb and assume you're not a big parkour person? She teased as he hit the asphalt. Buddy chuckled. Not sure what that is, but if it's anything even remotely athletic, the answer is a definite no. She laughed as well, and then held out her hand. I'm Nadia, it's nice to meet you. Buddy, he said as they shook, and likewise. She inclined her head towards the truck. So you came all this way just to bring us this? Yes, ma'am, he replied. She grinned. In that case, you mind if I hitch a ride with you back to base? She asked. I can show you where the loading dock is. Buddy extended his hand as if he were a car show model, presenting the passenger door to her and opening it with a flourish. After you. 
Nadia clambered up into the cab, and Buddy walked around the front, watching the shielders scrape the last of the bodies out of the lane so he had a clear path. He gave them a thumbs up before climbing up into the driver's seat to head to the casino. Chapter 12 Buddy backed the truck up to the loading dock as someone waved him in. He lined it up perfectly and shut off the rig. Why don't you come inside, Nadia asked. I know Mr. Kenneth would like to meet you. Buddy raised an eyebrow. So everybody calls him Mr. Kenneth and not just Kenneth, he asked. Yeah, it's a long story, she replied, waving her hand. Don't worry, he's far too polite to be offended by it. He smiled as they got out of the truck and climbed up the stairs to the loading dock. A few civilians headed out with a few older men in the lead. Hi, Daddy, Nadia greeted one of the men and embraced him. The older man smiled into her hair. There's my baby girl, he said. Y'all have any problems? Nah, it was a piece of cake, she replied, waving him off. Our new friend Buddy here is quite the crack shot. Buddy scratched the back of his head, a little embarrassed. I wouldn't go quite that far. How you doing, Buddy? Nadia's father asked, and they shook hands. I'm Vernon, and this here is our community leader, Mr. Kenneth. Buddy turned to the leader, shaking his hand as well. Pleasure to meet you in person, Mr. Kenneth. Likewise, the man replied, offering a warm smile. I'm not sure that we can properly thank you for all the goods that you have brought us. It's my pleasure, Buddy said, returning the smile. Although I wanted to mention, you know that trouble I talked about earlier? Well, they may have snagged a few things from the load here. He clucked his tongue. From what they tell me, there should be plenty of food, weapons, and supplies for you to be able to grow your own sustainable food. Kenneth nodded in approval. From the looks of it, you have brought us plenty. He spread his arms. Please, won't you come in? Our people will handle the unloading. Buddy nodded, and the quartet headed inside. They walked through a kitchen area that was full of people working away on the stoves and ovens. I don't know what's cooking, but that's the single best smell I've come across in weeks, Buddy said, taking a deep breath of the busy kitchen. Nadia smiled and ran over to one of the ovens. She peeked inside and then donned a mitt, pulling out a pan of fresh biscuits. She carefully picked up a piping hot morsel and carried it over, handing it to Buddy. He took a long sniff and closed his eyes. Oh my God, that's amazing, he moaned. It's even better when you eat it, Nadia said in an exaggerated whisper, and he laughed. He took a generous bite, moaning at the buttery flavor in his mouth. Vernon shot his daughter a playful glare as she bit into her own that she had pilfered for herself. She held it out to him with a sweet smile, but he chuckled and shook his head no. They exited the kitchen into the dining room, where several people were setting up tables for a meal. Dinner isn't for another hour, but when it comes around, I insist that you join us, Kenneth said. Buddy grinned. I would appreciate that a lot, he admitted. They headed through into the main lobby of the giant hotel, stopping at the balcony over the casino floor. There were several people giving a deep clean to a portion of it, while others were enjoying a game of blackjack at one of the tables. Buddy took it all in as he finished chewing his biscuit, looking up at the huge number of rooms above. I have to admit, this is all pretty impressive, he said. Thank you, Kenneth replied, clasping his hands in front of him. It did come at a steep price, however. Buddy sighed, shaking his head. Best things in life usually do. It took us a while, but we got every floor of this hotel cleared out, Vernon said proudly. Rooms are all set up. We got food, water, and even some entertainment. Even if the money ain't what it used to be. Buddy chuckled. Still, it's good to stay entertained. We don't have a lot here, Kenneth admitted. However, we welcome people in who find their way to us. I want you to know that you are free to stay with us as long as you wish. We have plenty of room, and thanks to you, plenty of food to last us. He looked around, seriously contemplating the idea, but ultimately had to shake his head no. You have a fantastic setup here, he said honestly. 
And believe me when I tell you that I would love to ride out the storm here with you. But there are hundreds more survivor groups just like you, who aren't in such a great position. I'm one of only a handful of truck drivers left, and I honestly don't think I could live with myself if I didn't get back into the fold. That's very selfless of you, Nadia piped up. Something that is in short supply these days. Buddy nodded. Ain't that the truth? Well, I will instruct my people to get that truck unloaded as quickly as possible, so that you can get back on the road after dinner if you wish, Kenneth replied. Buddy wrinkled his nose and cocked his head from side to side. Well, he drew out the word, I have put in a long day today. Got into a few scuffles to make sure this got here in mostly one piece. I don't think anybody is gonna mind if I take a day or two to recover. In that case, I will let them know to take their time, Kenneth replied. Nadia, will you please go to the front desk and get a room key for our guest? He looks like he could use a bit of relaxation before dinner. She nodded. Yes, Mr. Kenneth. She took off as Vernon stepped forward to shake his hand again. I'll go supervise the unloading, he said. Gotta make sure everything gets where it needs to go. It's been nice chatting with you and hope to do more of it over dinner. Buddy grinned as they shook. Same here, he said. He leaned back against the railing next to Kenneth, soaking in the sight in front of him with a big smile. Something on your mind? The older man asked. Buddy shook his head. Just happy to know that places like this still exist, he said. It's nice having a glimpse of a normal life again, even if it is only for a couple of days. I do hope that you enjoy yourself while you're here, Kenneth replied, and then looked at his watch. If you will excuse me, I have some things to attend to before dinner. If there is anything you require, please don't hesitate to ask. Buddy nodded. Thank you, Mr. Kenneth. He stretched his arms above his head, staring down at the casino floor as he contemplated his future. Nobody in the world would blame you if you decided to stay, he thought. But that decision could wait until after a hot shower and a home-cooked meal. End of book six. Up next, the action shifts back to El Paso as the Fabian survivors make a daring raid on Fort Stockton.